Yeah. Like, uh, anybody that's on Time Warner Cable has been out since like 7 o'clock yesterday evening. So. Yeah. <laughs> Wish I could say the same. Okay. There's that three nines, four nines, five nines discussion. <laughs> okay, first off, your last reminder, internship meeting this afternoon. I don't think you need me to go through the whole song and dance, but there is one more this afternoon at 3.30 in the auditorium. Okay. Um, okay. We started on a design problem, started working through it, and uh, we left class. You guys are going to work on it and come on back. Actually, before I get into that, let me ask, did anybody have particular trouble getting into the lab, getting logged in, getting all that working? I love it. <laughs> that, may be, that may be the first online thing we've done here that actually went smoothly <laughs> the first time through. <laughs> okay, so let me get back over to our question. I do have my solution that I will hand out to you towards the end of class. It is no better or no worse than anybody else's. It's simply my solution to this problem. Okay. Uh, what I want to do today before I hand that to you, however, is to look through your solutions and discuss them. If what the way I would like to conduct this, you guys have enough. Let's see. I'm trying to walk and chew gum at the same time. Hold on. You guys have enough um, practice with the problems we've been doing now that what I'd really like to do is when I ask a question about one of these interfaces, somebody give me a solution, and then if you have something different, please bring it up. Let's discuss that. It's going to be the best way to get through all this and kind of see the alternatives. You know, uh, Sometimes it's as simple as you're thinking of the network one way, somebody else is thinking of it another way. Not a right or wrong, just ways of looking at a problem. There are, of course, some things that you can do things that won't work, and those we'll try to ferret those out. But uh, and then before the end of class, I want to talk a little bit ahead about the problem I posed with what happens if one of these ports isn't stationary with respect to a piece of equipment. How do we deal with that? And we can actually take that to two levels, and you're going to this week. So. Everything that's electronic is giving me trouble today. It's my aura. Okay, so we started in on this. How far did we get? Remind me. <coughs> I'm sorry? We'd, we'd talked about, we did San Francisco, and I think we had done all of the number completes, hadn't we? Or we just done San Francisco? Just San Francisco, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll come back to that. Okay, so considering that map. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's why I ended up with an extra. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so don't let me forget to give you these. That's my favorite trick is to bring it to class and forget to give it to you. So with San Francisco, we identified number complete templates. What's the job of a number complete template? Okay, let me, let me ask the question a different way. With respect to the switchboard, what does the number complete template do? What's, what, what does it accomplish? Yeah, it lets us know when that number, you're, same thing you're saying, I just wanted to state it a different way. It lets us know when the switch has received enough digits to route that call. Okay. What does the number complete template not do? 
it does not route calls. Exactly right. They are two different functions. In that, in that diagram we looked at back here, actually that was it. Um, in this diagram, the process is we match the number complete template. Once that has matched, the switchboard says, okay, I have enough to make a routing decision, and it starts making matches of patterns assigned to interfaces. That's the routing process. So two steps go on there. If we have a reject in the mix, the reject comes after the number complete template is matched, but before the accept templates. Reject always overrides an accept, always. Okay. So what we're doing is defining this is a complete number, and that's where we got to with San Francisco. So let me put the ones I've got up there and see if you have any different ones. I ended up with we said 911 and since we're using 9 as an escape digit we said 9911. We want both of those to be accepted. We'll deal with routing them in a minute. 1 1 2 XX We discussed the ways of handling other sites. I chose to use the steering digit to steer everything that way. So what I did was five and four digits for one of the sites. Hang on. <laughs> for Nashville. I used six and four digits for... Atlanta, we have local numbers, 9NXX, XXXX, which is our North American numbering plan, and we had 1NX, actually I said 9-1, didn't I? 1-9. Nine, nine. I hadn't updated my solution sheet. 1-9NXX, NXX, XXXX. X, 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 X. I told you to think about these as types of calls, if you will, C calls that share cir circumstances, where they're going. These two we want to route absolutely because they're emergency numbers. They're going to the LEC only. This one is our internal dial plan for extension to extension. This is one other site. This is another other site. Local calls on our LEC, long distance in North America. Now, what if I add a fourth site in here? What do I have to add in here with this scheme? Let's say I add, who do I not have? Let's say we put Seattle on here. Yeah, and if I want to keep it consistent with this, what I'm going to do is pick a digit and assign it to Seattle so it'll be like 7XXXX, okay? Did anybody solve that part of the problem another way, to get from San Francisco to another site on net? I just use 8 as a steering digit for anything on the project. Okay. So I'm going to say <laughs> or, <laughs> big or, 8, and you just used 8 XXXX? Okay. Okay. So, eight dash eight two three six seven XX. Okay. That way, it's just, it's a lot more. That way, you got both of them in there without any there. With my scheme, if what happens if we have a lot of growth and we add ten sites to this network? I run out of steering digits. Now, could I deal with it? Sure. I could share steering digits, but that starts getting confusing. That's the beauty of this scheme. Eight is on net somewhere else, which is another way to think about it. It's, very, it's a perfectly good solution. 
Um, the reason I do it this way, to me, if I'm looking at this in a list, this is easier to see. That's just the way my brain works. I just thought that now I get it might be easier to use something like seven instead of eight for single digit because of the eight. Mm -hmm. of Either way. Yeah, you but but notice what he's done here. You know, we, he has a single steering digit, so I can expand this to 50 sites without too much trouble. You'd have to change the match pattern out here, and as you got more sites, what you're probably going to do is 8 XXXX. In fact, probably that's what I would do here instead of limiting this. This is, you can argue it either way. If I do this and I add another site that doesn't match this, then, I, then it's not going to work. This is very general match. This matches eight, or in this case, six, followed by any four digits. So six, one, 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 so <laughs> whatever. Be another. That'd be another way to do it. Yeah. Um, and that, and that's, and that's the point I'm trying to make. Is there is no one right way to do this. When you decide on a way, what you want to do is be consistent. This is just fine. Understand that your management part of this is as you add sites, you have to make sure that this matches the four digit extensions at those sites. Okay? Not a huge task. You have to remember to do it. If we are consistent and eight is always an on net call with four digits, then I cover that with one in that. This is a little easier to, you know, see where sites are going. You know, I don't have to look here and then go down to an interface. Which one's right? None of them. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? Okay, that's that's the point I want you to watch is that there are lots of ways to do this, and it's up to what are you trying to accomplish. Whatever you do, write it down. <laughs> Put your thoughts on paper in a file somewhere. Let people know what you're doing. In a lot of switches, you can actually annotate the config file. You know, the ones we're going to be working with mostly this semester, you can do that. It is like a Cisco config file. You go below that entry and star it off and write your little notes in there. Annotate it. Somebody's going to come behind you and have to make this thing work or modify it. If you're me, you're going to come behind you in six months and not remember what you did six months ago, so the notes help. <laughs> Ask my wife. Okay, um, how are we going to route, once we have the number completes set, how are we going to deal with routing 911 and 9911 in San Francisco? Isn't that where we, yeah, San Francisco. Where do 911 calls go? To the LEC. What's the problem with doing it this way? Um, could be, but since remember, remember we have a number complete pattern that matches this exactly, and we're matching it exactly. So that, yes, it could be a problem. It's not likely to be. The real problem is if I'm anywhere out in that LEC and I want to get to 911 services, what do I dial? It's not a trick question. <laughs> 911. How many digits is that? Great. We're in good shape here. Now I've got a problem. I send this to the LEC. Do you know, do LECs, will LECs normally translate anything like that? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I have always assumed they did not. Okay. It is possible the LEC would translate that. In other words, just receive this and say, oh, that's 911. Your safest thought is that that they will not. So on that interface, if you choose to route that, you're going to have to deal with that extra digit somehow. Depending on the piece of equipment you have, there are different ways to do that. I don't want to go any further into that discussion today. But you do have an extra digit here. No, because that's a steering digit. 
I'd delete it. Yeah, what I'm saying, but I'm, see, this was matching a pattern for complete. Now I'm routing a call, and I have two different links that I'm routing, and I'm sending digits to the other end. One of them is a valid call, the other one has an extra digit. So. And the reason, the, finish the thought and I'll come back. The reason I don't want to deal with it is different pieces of equipment will handle that differently. Okay, I'm sorry, your question was? What you will usually do, <laughs> you've talked me into going a little further, what you will usually do, you'll do something called a translation. And so what you will do, if I were doing this in the equipment we have in this lab, I would do this locally. First off, I do not assign that internally as an extension. Don't laugh, it happens. Second, what a translation does is say, when you see 9911, substitute 911 and then route it. Oh, well, I didn't understand you to say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That works. Just understand it's, a, it's, a, it's an extra step. You, you, this doesn't happen automatically. You have, you have to do this actively. If I, if I just put this in and then route to the LEC, it won't work. This will work. That won't. Done. Okay. Like I said, this class for 911 is mostly about awareness. It is an entire class and subject by itself. It's big. There are database integration, dealing with it, all sorts of things. It's about awareness. Don't just say, oh, well, it's 911. We'll pass it. You have to deal with it. <laughs> and the best thing is to read the books, ask somebody who's there already, find out your local environment on that one. Um, what about routing? to other sites from San Francisco. What am I going to put on interface D as an accept rule? Where does interface D go? Okay. How are we knowing, how do we know that when somebody dials a number we have enough information. I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but how do we know we have enough information to make that routing decision to Nashville? In my scheme, five, eight. in my scheme, this is Nashville. Okay. Pardon? Well, I'm not for an on net call. No, you don't. Oh, it's, a mm -mm. it's a private network. All this is private. This is four-digit dialing on a private net. Point-to-point -point T1s, if you want to think of it that way. The LEC, the public calls go to the LEC at each place. Right. These are private point-to-point the -point T1s. And the, IXC? the IXC is shared out of Nashville. Yeah, if I'm, in, the, if I'm in, in this scenario I dreamed up, if I'm in San Francisco and I want to make a long distance call, it'll route to, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't follow what you asked the very first time, I'm sorry, yes. Yes, you're right, we have to, we have to send that across the net to national. I'm sorry, I, I interpreted your question another direction. I'm sorry, <laughs> I interpreted that you meant no, you could go through the public net to get to Nashville. I was like, that's not what we want to do, I understand now. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. So yes, let me let me finish the thought now. Yes, if I'm sitting in Atlanta and I want or in San Francisco and I want to make a long distance call, I will route one NXX or some way. I'm sorry. So that accept rule is on interface B. Yes, yes, that's what he was saying, and I thought I went down the wrong rabbit hole. <laughs> so, okay, so we're going to accept the range for. Nashville, 
which would be in my scheme is 6xxx. That's the on net calls. I would also accept long distance. I could do that by 19nxx, nxxxxxx. Is there another way I could handle that? Some other sites on those extensions and there's certain I lost my Okay, okay. <laughs> With what I've given you as a class, long distance calls could be routed a couple of ways. We could do that. Ah, you say. But what about this one? Explain to me why that would still work for long distance with this as a matched pattern. Hmm? Remember, this is a routing command, not I can't I can't use dollar sign as a number complete template because you have to specify a number of digits. But as a routing rule, on an interface, say on interface D, I use one dollar sign. Now interpret that routing rule with this set of number complete templates. What are you going to dial? If I'm sitting in San Francisco and I'm going to dial 1-901-555-1212, what's the first thing that happens in San Francisco? I'm going to dial, I dial 9, whatever I said, <laughs> 19901. It's going to match one of these patterns. Okay. At that point, it hands it to the routing process. Okay. The routing process is going to do what? Switchboard process, if you will. That's the second thing it does. It finds all the matches and then does what? Then identifies the best match and uses that. Between that and that, which is a better match for long distance? This isn't a very good match, but long distance doesn't match this. I'm not going to find a long distance number that has one, one as the first two digits. I'm not going to find a long distance match that has one, two, and only two other digits. Okay, this is a more specific match for local calls, but it doesn't match long distance. So it's going to follow this. That'd be okay. The other way you can do it is to say one nine dollar sign. In essence, you have two steering digits there. Okay. Okay. If I'm at Nashville and I want to make a long distance call, where do I put my routing rule? And what routing rule is that? Put it on K because that goes to long distance and what am I going to route? How am I actually going to specify what goes through that port? What pattern? One nine dollar sign? I could use one dollar sign? Okay. When I send, well, I don't want to go there yet. Okay. I'm hearing that you've got a pretty good handle on this. Let me ask this. Do I need to use any reject rules in this scheme? Do I need to, for example, to ensure the 911 calls go to the left. Do I need to put a reject 911 and reject 9911 on um, A, C, and D in San Francisco? I see some maybes. I see I'm not sure. I see some head shaking. Why not?
Right. I have a specific accept that is going to steer 911 calls. When do I use a reject? I gave you a specific I gave you a specific way to remember rejects. You use a reject rule to stop a call from going through an interface that would otherwise be allowed to pass. In the situation I just gave you, 911 is not going to match anywhere else. No match means no route. Okay? I use a reject to stop a call that would otherwise be allowed to route through an interface, and I don't need to do that in that situation. I use that one because that's one I've seen people do before. Oh, I want to make real sure it gets there. You just made yourself a heck of a lot of work and probably confused the dickens out of whoever came by. <laughs> okay. Are you okay on this? We'll get some more practice. Believe me, you'll have practice on this. Well, are you comfortable enough to move on to a discussion that complicates this idea a little bit. Let me give you my solution to this first with the understanding that, of course, it's a heart problem, therefore I have a mistake on it, and I'll point that out and just to say it's the, one, it's the one we found. I didn't update it to make long distance 1-9. So. And again, my solution. Not the right solution, just my solution. Okay? Yeah, no. Glad I have my sweater on. Yeah, I'll I'll grab him one in a minute. There you go. Yeah. Take a minute to look over that. Um, the mistake I have is my number complete template for long distance just says 1 NXX NXX. I had changed this for the purposes of the discussion, and I didn't get my, um, my solution sheet updated, which I will change as soon as I get back to my office. I'm sorry? At San Francisco? I want to go to the lake. Yeah. Okay, now that my heart has slowed down. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> really dumb mistake. And again, you didn't do it this way, that's fine. What I would ask that you do is take your solution and compare it to this and just think what the advantages and disadvantages of each are. Okay? You know, you're at the level now where your opinions are about as good as anybody's on how to do this stuff. Okay? Anything in particular you want to ask about? Okay. So, the way I want to complicate our lives a little. This is, as I said, going into this, a PSTN circuit switched view of how we do this. And I want to go back to that idea of identity and endpoint and all that stuff that we talked about earlier. In this scheme, how did I assign a telephone number to make that phone ring? And I chose my words very carefully in saying it that way. How do I make that phone ring with a particular phone number? I can wait. <laughs> exactly. Where do I put the accept rule? on the switch 
that that's plugged into. So if I take if I go to Walmart and buy a cheap phone and plug it into that interface, what number is it going to ring with? The one that's on that interface. If I have a really nice, expensive desk phone that costs 300 bucks from phones.com or whatever and plug it into that port, it's going to ring with that same number. In this scheme, phones don't have an identity. One phone is the same as another. The, no, the way you match a particular physical instrument in this world to a number is which interface you plug it into. Okay? It worked beautifully for 120 years. <laughs> Actually, still works pretty well. It's just pretty limiting now that we've developed the idea of IP and packet based stuff. Now, let me ask you a question. If I want to make this ring, Where's the interface on that? No, you don't have to have had 320 or 321 to answer that question. Yeah. This phone has processing power and is a network device, meaning it has an identity that is in the operation of this device. When I turn this on, it says hello to the network. It identifies itself. It says, I am. The network says, prove it. You know, you've been down this road before. Who are you? Jay Hart. Prove it. Here's my password. You have essentially the same thing going on here. So the difference between this and this is that the identity stays wherever I carry this phone. In this situation, if I unplug this physical phone from that interface and I carry it up here, <laughs> what number is going to make that phone ring? the one assigned to this interface. So the phone doesn't have the identity. That's what I was trying to set the stage for when we talked about identity earlier. Now, we are not talking about cellular, so I'm not going to go any further in that line. Yes? I'm sorry? I'm a little confused on this solution. Okay. On my Thunder Cam, it says go to D. Yeah. Does it say San Francisco B? D. D. Okay. And our template is 6XXX. Mm hmm. That, that's an or. I gave you two different solutions on that page. 6XXXX is one way of doing it. The other way is to specifically define the range that's down there. Basically, one solution is very, very general. The other solution is very, very specific. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'll rework this. My bad. Go ahead and pitch those, and I'll rework this and get, send you the updated one. Good catch. So in this world, the identity on a phone, the phone doesn't have an identity. Its, it's identity is whatever interface on switch it's plugged into and what identity we assign to that port. In a cellular world, we have a phone that is a network device. You guys are familiar with how that works. What happens, what, how do you take your computer and use it at your house? How does it get on the internet from your house? Well, that's too easy. <laughs> how, how does it talk to your router? What layers are used there? Three. And? And IP, or IP is the layer 3 address, right? What's I, what is layer 3's job? It is to route, but more basically, layer 3's job is to be aware of other networks. Layer 2 is only aware of one network, the local network. If it doesn't exist on the local network, it doesn't exist. Okay. So when you turn on your computer or you have your device hit your wireless network, which is a Layer 2 network, it 
communicates with the local network interface on the router and says, I need an IP address. I need people out in the world to be able to find me. So you get an IP address that way. Your router has its own outside IP address, and we manage things by the layer three addressing. If I go to Amazon.com, I don't know and I don't care what the MAC address on that Amazon machine is. All I care is that I can get to it. Okay. Similarly, that machine doesn't know and doesn't care what my local network looks like. It just needs to know where it is from a layer three point of view. That's the situation we have. But now let's think about it in terms of interfaces. Let's say, let me grab a prop back here. So this is an IP phone. If you look on the back, it has an Ethernet interface. Actually, it has two Ethernet interfaces. We'll talk about what the second one's for later on. It has an Ethernet interface. When I plug it into the local network, it's going to do exactly what any other computer on the network does. It's going to wake up, do its power on self-test. It's going to go out on the network and say, I need an IP address. DHCP request, and it's going to get an IP address. It's also going to find out about default gateway. It's going to find several pieces of information. We'll actually dig pretty deeply into the boot process for the phone. But for this discussion, it is going to have an identity okay, at layer three. Okay. How do I associate a phone number with that? And more importantly, if I then, well, no, let's go down there. How do I associate a phone number with that if I'm running a server? Why do I want to associate it with the MAC address? Yeah, if I put this on my home network and it goes to wherever the server is and registers, it's going to do it with whatever my home network addressing is. If I unplug that and take it somewhere else, which is the whole point of what we're talking about doing with this, and plug it into another IP network, I still need it to get an address. And I can't do that with an IP address because it changes depending on my location. Okay. So if I associate it with the MAC address, what's unique about the MAC address? What's the other name for MAC address? Hardware address or physical address. In other words, it is an address that is uniquely associated with this device, this exact serial number device. And so what I'm going to do is associate that layer two address with an identity. That layer two address becomes the interface. Okay? That's where the identity is tied. Now, if I then take this phone and I plug it in my home network and it says, Hi, I'm 00A0C8615F8E. <laughs> You'll see this in the lab over the next couple of weeks. The switch where I've built the identity for this device is going to say, Oh, <laughs> okay, here you go. Your identity is 6841. Here, by the way, is the network environment. Here's where the server where you can get your phone book is, and here's where all these other pieces you need are. So that's done by MAC address. Okay? Oh, I see you're at IP192, or it'd have to be a public address, or have to be an address on there. It's on the local network. Say 192.168.1.20. Then I'll keep you there. If you move, let me know. <laughs> I'll move over here. Okay, now you're at 10, 10, 20 dot 16. Okay, got it. You see what's going on? The identity is tied to MAC address. The location is tied to IP address. And then we update that as we go along. 
that can get horribly intricate. <laughs> we're going to break that several times this semester. Let me ask this. There are things called soft phones. A soft phone is an application that runs on a device. I can get a soft phone for my computer. In fact, you're going to use one in lab this week. When I start that, it's an application, it's going to register as well, but we've kind of changed the world, haven't we? What if I want to run my soft phone with my John Hart's telephone number on this and on this and on my office machine back in my office or on my home machine, but I want to have the same phone number on each of those. I can't associate with the MAC address at that point anymore, can I? And I don't really want to because do we necessarily have just one MAC address on a computer? Anybody ever seen a computer with more than one MAC address? Yeah, sure. Well, lots of them. This device has three MAC addresses. It has one for that port that I can tie to a, a wired Ethernet port. It has the wireless Ethernet port, and I have a cellular modem in this. So I, don't, I can't tie that to a MAC address in that world. And, you, and let me draw you back to another conversation we've had. Remember when I told the story about my mother and Clotilde Tucker and all that and how the call delivered in spite of the network. That's what we're trying to do. We still can't quite do it that well, but we're getting better. I can have my number associated with multiple devices. And basically, I'll let the network know which one I'm using. We'll come back to that more later, too. What I could do, however, remember what we did with this? Hi, my MAC address is, and the server said, oh, well, Here's your identity, Six, what I use, 6841. What if I said, hi, I'm 6841, <laughs> and I want to register? System, like any other good network system, is going to say, prove it, ask you for a password. How's it going to communicate with you at that point? IP. You sent a packet across an IP network to a particular address that you learned about through DHCP. We'll leave that there for now. We pass that in DHCP. Or I program it into a soft phone heart. When you get that message and you see that my identity is 6841 and I provide you with the correct password, you assume that that really is 6841. And so you say, OK, I see you are at IP address whatever. So now I've got an identity that can follow me from device to device to device. Okay? That's the world we're going to. And the reason I go through all this song and dance is instead of having the simple connection up here where I assign a number to a port, one of the hardest things, it's not impossible, one of the hard things to do in this world is to make the same number route to two different locations simultaneously. It's possible to do. It's problematic. It's not a big trick in this world. <laughs> big deal. Okay. So what we're going to do now is start carefully walking through how we associate this dial plan stuff we've been doing with different ways of achieving a network interface. And I will warn you, it's going to be confusing. You've you, you are leaping about uh, 90 years of technology in this leap. We, did, we stayed with this was the world into the 1980s, and it worked very well. In the last 30 years, we've come hugely down the line. Okay? You're going to be confused when we do these labs. I'm going to try to avoid as much of that as I can. I won't try to avoid all of it, I'll be honest. I don't mind making you think a little bit. But just to understand, you, this stuff's complicated. You're going to have to think through it. Okay. So Friday, give me just a second. Friday, what we're going to do is set up a dial plan that will show you 
how we take this idea and move it into a packet world. We actually have to put another piece in this to make all this work. And that's what we're going to point out in lab on Friday. Okay? See you guys. And I'll get the uh, corrected solution up. I'm sorry for the trouble. Fair enough.